This is Salma Schimmel for the Group Room at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. Joining us now is Dr. Larry Norton, Deputy Physician-in-Chief for Breast Cancer Programs at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Medical Director of the Evelyn H. Lauder Breast Center, and Scientific Director of the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. Hello good, again, Dr. Norton. Good afternoon. Good to be here. More than 80% of cancer patients are treated in the private sector in the community. Right. They're not treated at cancer centers. Right. Here you have a, a medical oncologist that sees every cancer type in his or her office. And I wonder what you see the future of private practice medicine being at the speed at which information is being introduced. How can they adequately keep up and effectively treat a variety of cancers right. under one practice. By the way, the problem already also exists even in the academic centers, all right? So I'm a specialist in breast cancer, and that's really where my, where, where my focus is. I can't go all, to all the meetings. I can't read all the journals, and I can't stay up to date on everything. Fortunately, we have this army of, of, of colleagues, you know, that, that we work with, and we make sure that all the major areas are covered and we talk to each other, we actually have internal conferences. So after this conference and after the ASCO conference, after AACR conference, we will have internal communications about what people heard so we can have internal discussion and debate about it. So even in a very highly specialized, very, very large group of people who are focused mm -hmm. on one particular disease, we still need to work out methods of being able to capture all the information. Um, I have a I have a dream about that, and just you know, and I'm and I'm working actually hard to accomplish this. And this is uh, uh, that IBM is collaborative with Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, on is a this project. This the rapid learning system. Well, this rapid learning system, uh, this the ASCO rapid learning system, and that is also very important. And you know, someday we may be able to bring together all these minds. But I'll talk to you about the Watson project. Cause that's the one I'm closest to. Watson is a computer system that IBM has developed. That uh, its, its major claim to fame so far is that it's beaten the world's experts in Jeopardy. This TV game where you given an answer and you have to you have to say what the question was to give you that answer and that, that's a very hard game because it's not just facts but you have to reason you have to know puns you have to know humor you 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 you, you have to be very creative in your thinking in that regard it was it was the classic example of something that machines couldn't do that only humans could do and yet there's a machine that can beat anybody at that and you know in, in you know in that in that regard and it does it with extraordinary technology because it can um, uh, it's not just what is the right answer but what is the right algorithm for this kind of question to get to that answer is, is, is the essence of it. So what we're trying to do now at Memorial, and we're, right now Mark Chris is, is heading the team doing it in lung cancer, and I'm heading the team that's doing it in breast cancer with wonderful colleagues. And what we're trying to do is basically teach Watson how to assimilate information, how to interpret information, and how to match that information with the conclusions that the, the experts at Memorial Sloan Kettering would come up with uh, in that regard. In other words, capture our wisdom. Um, and, uh, I'm sorry, is Watson, is Watson a computer? Watson's a machine, yeah. Okay. Watson's a machine, yeah. And, 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 and the idea is that there's a certain, certain amount of data input that we have for our decisions. We make certain decisions. How do we connect those, those input variables to those decisions is, you know, is the issue. And it's not always the same. I mean, we don't, humans don't use the same algorithms for processing information for each particular kind of, kind of problem. That's where the human interaction part of it comes, comes in. And we're working to try to capture that. The other thing that Watson can do, the computer Watson can do, is, uh, is, is read. Uh, it's called natural language processing, and it can it can read uh, re read written records on patients. And obviously, you know, we're not quite there yet. We're working toward there. And certainly, can read journal articles, and it can read newspaper reports, and it could read in natural language. So far, only English, but natural language, you know, and assimilate everything it's reading, make the, make the connections, learn the particular facts, and never forget anything, because that's that's where computer differs from a medical oncology fellow is, med is the computer doesn't forget anything and therefore um, uh, and therefore uh, you know be able to provide that information now Watson is not going to make decisions Watson is going to ask questions you know on the basis of what what this input this these inputs these are suggested things that can be done other tests that can be done mm -hmm things that may that might make sense about the data set that you may want to look at more carefully, or actually suggested actions with probability statements about how much confidence the machine has in those particular actions, and, uh, and, and have a back and forth. If the physician disagrees with Watson, the physician can say why, and, and that goes back into the, in, in, into the process so that so there could be mutual learning. Um, it, this is really not that much unlike when I examine a, a patient and I come up with a medical decision. I've got a really top-notch fellow with me, 
Because very often the, the fellow will ask me a question, uh, Larry, why did you do such and such? And that will make me think about it in a, in a different way and, and, and influence my thinking about a particular case. Larry, you're suggesting this for the patient, why did you do that? And I say, well, these are the reasons, and I explain it, and in the process of explaining it, I say, you know, in fact, we ought to maybe consider this as well. And so the interactiveness of the, the two doctors in that situation, and in my particular office, we sometimes have four or five doctors in that situation exchanging views, actually helps clarify our own thinking. And then we go back to the patient, and we can then have a discussion with the patient about what the patient's preferences are. You know, we can do this and this, and these are the consequences, or we can do this, and, and the, these are the consequences. And this is where we have hard data, and this is where we don't have hard data. This is where we have a, a general feeling, you know, as to where things are evolving, and this is where the studies are very clear cut. And and then, and then I hear what the patient feels about that and then arrive at a proper decision together. It's a conversation. It's a conversation among experts. Well, you're right. Practicing oncologists in the community, and there are fantastic practicing oncologists in the community, just extraordinarily you know, warm, compassionate, knowledgeable, intelligent people that are in the community. And, uh, but they can't be up to date on everything that's changing, and they can't be at all the meetings. And especially, you know, I'm just talking about breast cancer specialty. If they're taking care of many kinds of cancers, there's no way they could be up to date. But Watson can be, and so, and so that information can then be provided to the practicing oncologist in such a way that, that the practicing oncologist will think about things, and maybe even reach areas where they say, well, this is a really tough one, I better call a real human expert and see what they feel about it, which is also part of the process, and doctors do this all the time. I spend hours a week on the phone and by email with colleagues in the community with, with not so straightforward problems and, and, and insights about how to deal with it. So, so, so information technology is expanding the opportunities for us in that regard, and, and I think that's going to be another major revolutionary change in how we practice medicine. Watching <clears throat> the acquisition of private practices or, you know, the small practice, one or two doctor physician practice mm -hmm. or oncology practice is becoming more and more remote. What do you think is the future of private practice oncology? I don't know. I don't know the answer to the question. Um, some people are predicting the end of private practice medical oncology, the formation of very large groups, um, uh, hospital-based practices. Some people are predicting that. I don't know if that's the right answer. Um, you know, there's something to be said about somebody who's right around the corner who really knows you and knows you really well and knows the environment that, 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 that you're in. Uh, and, and I think that there's, there's, there's real pluses there. I mean, I know practitioners, solo practitioners in oncology in the community doing a fantastic job. And, uh, and, and, and that, I'd hate to see that lost. So I don't know the answer to the question. And, and that's, that gets back to how we started this interview. The question is, how do you act when you're in a position to modify the future when you don't know what the right avenue is necessarily? You know, you've you got to know what you know in medicine, but you also got to know what you don't know. And you can't say the answer is when, when it's not clear. I don't know the way it's all going to evolve. But I do know that however it evolves, uh, molecular pathology, molecular oncology is going to be a very important part of what we do. Uh, access to medications, you know, you know, universally, maybe from small subsets of patients can be a very important part of what we do. Extremely sophisticated testing, and not just in the pathology laboratory, but imaging. Imaging is one of the fastest growing areas now. Some fantastic things at this meeting about what can be, what, what can be learned from people by, by imaging, imaging their bodies and Im imaging their tumors. So access to that technology is going to be very important. Processing all that information is going to be very important. And I think we have to pursue all of this with an open mind. And, and keep all of our options open. Uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an experimentalist by nature, and so I'd like to see a lot of different ways of delivering health care tried, and, but monitored carefully, so we actually have the data on how things are going. Uh, I'm not going to guess where it's all going, but, but I do know that we're not going to get where we're going if we don't have good lines of communication if we don't have good access to information, if we don't have good follow-up of patients, is, 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 is the information that we gather in this regard, trying all these things and learning from them, is really going to be totally critical for us to make the right decisions in war from the future. Uh, in this regard, too, is, it's not one or the other. And I have patients that I see like every three or four months that are taken care of in the community. And as long as things are going well, I don't see them. When they reach a choice point, they see me, and then I go over the case, and then I and then, then I communicate with the practicing doctor. So there's, there's lots of different practice models. Do you think that subspecialties in oncology is going to become more essential? Or, or less essential. Uh, let's look at the analogy of infectious disease. 
So when I was in medical school, one of my great mentors was a specialist in pulmonary infections. Mm -hmm. uh, another person I, re I, I, I had enormous um, uh, affection for, as well as respect for, was a specialist in kidney infections only. When I went through further training, uh, you know, I, I was trained by somebody who was a specialist in liver infections. These are infections. These are, these are viruses and bacteria that affect these particular organs. Yes, they were dealing with infections, but they were dealing with organ systems because you needed a lot of knowledge. A lot of the treatment of pulmonary infections was surgical. When to drain the empyema, when to even do a lobectomy for an abscess that wasn't, that wasn't getting better. The antibiotics really weren't very good. And so there were surgical decisions. There were surgical specialists in, in pulmonary infections, in fact. Whole books were really written on that, on that topic. Now, you know, big, big hospitals are run by very small departments of infectious disease because the information you get, because if you take a sample of the, of the, of, of, of the bacteria and you send it to the laboratory, the laboratory can connect that bacteria with the right antibiotic, and many of these antibiotics are oral and non-toxic, and you don't need an infectious disease specialist to be able to cure that patient's infection. So, so now you're finding that, that the movement was from specialists in infectious disease that were organ system oriented. It sounds a lot like oncology, doesn't it? And, you know, organ system specialists in infectious disease to generalists because the, the, the molecular pathology of infectious disease has evolved in such, a, in such a dramatic direction. And also we've got ways of preventing, you know, hand washing certainly, um, but as well as, you know, we've got vaccines and we have means of preventing infections as well. So I would like to see medical oncology turn into infectious disease. I'd like to see prevention of many diseases by vaccination. I'd like to see good public health strategies that reduce the incidence of disease. So it won't be hand washing, but it'll be ways of dealing with obesity, you know, for example, just to just give one example. And I'd like to see that the molecular pathology gets so, and imaging gets so sophisticated that, uh, that and, 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 and the, health IT. And the information processed by IT in such a way mm -hmm. that you're not gonna need very med medical oncologists because it can be so easy to cure cancer. <laughs> and now on a really light note, right. I wanna show how balanced you are as a human right, being. Right. So I learned that you're a musician. Yeah. And, and by the way, I have to say that in my- This has no relevance whatsoever to the no. topic of the conversation. <laughs> well, but it could because yeah. It's part of you, and I, there, there's a point yeah. to it. Right. Some of the greatest physicians I have met worldwide, and I found this especially true amongst the European KOLs, they all have some fantastic artistic ability. Sculptors, writers, painters, musicians. Okay. And I only bring it up because it, one shows you as a very complex, well-rounded human being, and you, I, I, yeah. I just wanted to touch on the fact that right. you are a jazz musician. Well, let me, but no, the, the important thing about this is not about me, all right, number one, is, and I actually, I actually go out of my way to not mix the two lives, all right, because it's not, one's not relevant to the other. Actually, the persona of the musician and the persona of the physician are totally different personas, and they don't work, you know, and I'm always, always, you know, I mean, it, it terrifies me the notion that somebody would hear me play and said, you know, isn't it cute the doctor can play medicine? That, that really is really <laughs> irritating, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, but you, by the way, well, you don't get it from my music friends. They don't say, isn't it cute the musician can practice medicine? So that, you, don't, you don't get it on the other hand. But what it really, what it says something really very important, all right, which is that, that in Europe there has been and still is much more of an emphasis on, on culture, on the arts, uh, arts education, uh, and, uh, and the history of, of, of art, uh, contemporary things of what's happening in art, a tremendous focus on that. And that's why so many of my European colleagues, Martin Picard, who you just, uh, who you just, just interviewed, uh, you know, is, is a world-class piano player, world-class, and we've actually played together. And so, and, and, um, and, and, and that's a, um, uh, you know, that's, that's something that's there. We don't have that in the United States. There's been tremendous cuts in arts education in the schools and the emphasis of the arts in the schools. Um, you know, there was a time when almost everybody in high school learned to either sing or to play a musical instrument or do something in that, in that, in that particular area. And that was tremendously de-emphasized. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they tell me that half the kids going to, to, to music, music schools now don't know how to play an instrument. It's all electronic. It's all computerization, manipulation of sound electronically, which has a lot of merit to it, but it's not the same as, as actually putting your physical body into the process. And, and, and I think that, I think we've lost a lot in the process. And I, and I think that as a society, we've lost a lot in the process. And I would like to see uh, a, a greater emphasis on the arts in, in education and arts awareness in the public, as much as I'd like to see a greater emphasis on science education. Some of the hardest decisions you have are with people that just have such 
a, a, a primitive concept of what science is all about, that, that they can't really follow the logic of a conversation. And, uh, you know, you get somebody who says, you know, take this herb, you know, and then you say, you know, take this medicine. And you say, well, well how can I decide? I got the opinions of two different people, but, you know, both belief systems from two different people. It's dramatically different. One is a belief system. The other, the one I'm proposing is based on evidence. Scientific research, prospective randomized trials, statistical analysis, data and safety monitoring committees is an entirely different process than I read in an ancient manuscript somewhere that this leaf is going to be good for you. And, and yet we have a very, very large segment of the U.S. population that can't make that distinction. Uh, you know, the word randomization, uh, the word statistical analysis, I mean, it doesn't mean anything to them. The scientific method doesn't mean anything to them. And that is very, very, very serious. So I think that, that science education is really lacking, and I think education in the arts is very lacking. It, if we're going to have a really well-rounded society, <coughs> excuse me, where people can make good health decisions, we're going to have to work on that part, too. Well, for what it's worth, I think one of the reasons I've had such mm -hmm. admiration for you is mm -hmm. that I find you to be not only very complex, but this incredibly integrated human being. Mm. And so the fact that you're an artist, even though you don't want to talk about it, gives me, so you know how right. a patient feels, it mm. makes me feel much more mm. attached to you as a physician right. because you're more integrated, because I see well. you in a different way. <laughs> well, first of all, I'd like the interview to end at that point, but, but instead yes, I'm going to actually say something else, okay. which, is, which is this kind of thing. Uh, one of the important things that I teach people in terms of getting good health care, all right, after they finish an interview with a doctor, I always ask them, did the doctor ask you anything about your life other than your illness? And I think that's one of the really important tests about establishing doctor-patient relationships. If, if the physician has zero interest in any aspect of the person's life except their tumor, that's saying something very bad about the potential for that doctor-patient relationship. And so the fact that you're relating to me as a medical expert, you know, but it's also augmenting that to know something about my, my other interests is very encouraging about our relationship, and I want to thank you very much for this interview. Thank you, Dr. Norton. This has been, a, for me, a huge privilege to spend time like this with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Larry Norton, Deputy Physician-in-Chief for Breast Cancer Programs at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Medical Director of the Evelyn H. Lauder Breast Center, and Scientific Director of the Breast Cancer Research Foundation.